Hello again, friends, and welcome back to another edition of Ron Fuller's Studcast. I am the great Brian Last, and it's my pleasure to be with you once again as the Tennessee Stud takes us up and down that road of wrestling history, up and down the Smoky Mountains, as it were, telling us about his personal tales and what was happening all around him, of course, focusing in on Southeastern Championship Wrestling, but so much more. And before we get going any further, let me introduce him, the man of the hour, the host of the Studcast, the Tennessee Stud himself, Ron Fuller. Ron, how are you today? I'm doing great, my man. Doing just fine. Uh, very happy to be here and uh, about ready to get in that saddle and uh, take another big ride, man. I uh, think we're going we're gonna to have a good one today. We're going to cover a lot of ground today like we've been doing in the last few episodes. And now that we're uh, Southeastern Wrestling is up and operating, uh, it's just uh, it's uh, going to be a lot more fun, I think, for the fans to jumping on board at this point. And there's a lot of new ones. Thank you for that out there too. And in in, uh, in in Studland out there, we've got a lot more uh, audience building for our stud cast, and obviously for the uh, super stud cast. Well, on that topic, real quick before we get going, Ron, we want to mention once again super stud cast number sixteen with Les Thatcher discussing everything from changing the television stations in Knoxville and all the attention and awards that their new format and television innovations received. This is a really, really interesting show, I have to say. May have been the most fun Super Stud cast to record for me. It was just a blast to be a part of this. Check it out right now. If you enjoy Southeastern Wrestling Talk, you definitely need to hear this one. TNStud.com or Patreon.com slash StudCast. But, Stud, you said you're ready to get going. I'll be let you jump on lightning and take off right now, and we'll all follow right behind you. All right, my man. Uh, this week we're going to break break down the uh, Southern Championship match between Ron Wright and myself and uh, Lou Thez, of all people, is the special referee for that match. Uh, we're going to discuss some previous conversations I'd heard between Danny Hodge and Dale Lewis concerning the $1,000 challenge matches against the wrestling fans in the arena. Uh, we're going to highlight the growing rela- relationship between me and Jerry Jarrett and uh, and it involves it starts to begin to involve some swapping of talent between our two companies. Uh, we're going to talk about the upgrade in talent in the first four months of Southeastern Wrestling's existence. Just how much better the talent is in a four month period of time. Uh, and also, uh, we're going to talk about some great news that uh, my cousin Jimmy Golden is uh, committed to me to move into Knoxville and wants to become part of trying to build Southeastern Wrestling and help me in that direction. Uh, And then also we're going to talk about a little bit uh, about the February 28th, 1975 card coming to Knoxville and uh, where else I'm wrestling during that time frame. Uh, We're starting to prepare for a second Coliseum show in March of 1975. And, uh, we're going to have a little, I want to have a little segment at the end uh, and just talk about some facts about one of the wrestlers that's came and, and lived in, in Knoxville that's really going to help me build this territory and just exactly some of the remarkable things uh, that uh, I've discovered about Dale Lewis. And uh, so we're going to try to get all that into the day and, uh, we're going to do our best, so I'm just going to keep rolling. If it's all right, Brian, I'm going ahead with it, man. Uh, all right. Last week, we talked about the Saturday television program where the news was sprung on me that Luthez, uh, in a rare refereeing appearance, was going to be the third man in the ring for my Southern title defense against the number one hillbilly Ron Wright. Uh, and uh, let's discuss this most unusual match, especially since I just defended the title against Thez the week before and beat him in the middle of the ring. And Ron Wright gets involved and gets the decision reversed and uh, gets me disqualified. So, you know, strange deal here where I'm going to actually be wrestling against Ron Wright for my Southern title, but the referee is going to be Lou Thez, who I actually beat the week before. So now things are really stacked even worse for me in this big title events. And, uh, and I cheated to beat Thez, and now he's the referee in the match. So, you know, how the heck can he be an impartial referee at this point? So uh, before we get into this match, so let's talk about the entire card for February 21st, 1975. 
Uh, John Foley's going to open the night against Rocky Smith. Rocky Smith is the club-footed inferno, the tremendous veteran for many, many years, a tremendous worker. Another great match to open the card with, which I'm really happy. And these two veterans are are really going to have a great match. Uh, I remember watching this match and really being impressed at how hard these guys work in the first match. And that's so important in every card and getting getting the crowd uh, ready for the excitement that's going to happen the rest of the night. Second match is Jerry Jarrett and Jerry Bryant uh, versus Phil Hickerson and Doug Patton. And uh, it involves four wrestlers from Jarrett's West Tennessee territory on the other side of the state that are coming over now and starting to wrestle a little bit for me in Knoxville. Uh, since I'm going that other direction to wrestle for Jared in Memphis, it makes some sense. Les Thatcher's going to take on the talented Dutch Mantell in a rare single match between the two of them. Uh, Thatcher's going to win, and uh, he's going to receive an even bigger challenge the next week because he's going to get his hands on Danny Hodge. So, uh, you know, he's not going to be really rewarded that much for winning the match. He's going to have to work with Hodge the next week. Uh, Dale Lewis is going to wrestle Don Kent, a great veteran, but no match for the fabulous Dale Lewis. Uh, Lewis also wrestles three challengers from the audience after defeating Kent. Uh, later in that show, he's, we're going to discuss what's happening beside, behind the scenes pertaining to these challenge matches that uh, he's having against these people from the crowd. And, uh, and the main event really rocks another with another great crowd as former champion Luthez puts on the zebra stripes in my match against Ron Wright. I might add that Wright still had my secretary at ringside when he came down to the ring, and Thez is still upset that I outsmarted him the week before and beat him in the middle of the ring. So this match is a very tough one for me. Uh, Ron Wright does very little wrestling. Uh, and is more of a heel than I am during the entire match. Uh, you, it was hard to tell who the heel is a lot of times when I worked against Wright. Uh, Thez is very lenient toward Ron Wright, and the crowd loves that, obviously, because I'm a heel here. And more heat in the building. Uh, between Thez and I during the match, there's more heat that, between us than there is between me and Wright. And at the end of the match, that's going to be the, my downfall in this match. So I knew that having a special referee like this I, after beating him illegally the week before didn't give me much of a chance to do it again, this time against Ron Wright. Uh, you know, I know he's going to be really on, he's going to be really strict about uh, how he's going to referee this match. And uh, I'd been undefeated as Southern champion for almost two months at this point. Uh, I defended the title 13 times, but this match under these circumstances is going to be my most difficult to win. Uh, you, and you know it's hard enough to win a match where the fans don't, where the fans don't like you. When they're booing you to begin with, it's not a lot of incentive for you to win. But to win one like this, it's almost impossible. So in the end, what I expected was going to happen did, as both men conspired to take my title away. And you know I just want to describe the match to fans out there, you know, so they get a feel for exactly what this was like. Uh, right comes the ring again, and he brings my secretary, who's actually my wife, but she's posing as my secretary. And uh, and he's had her now for several weeks, and, you know, crowd's really delighted. They see him here with a secretary, and all. Oh, he makes a big deal out of the fact that she's with him. And uh, toward the end of the match, uh, Wright has me backed into the ropes, and we're exchanging punches when Thez grabs Wright from behind to drag him away from me. So I throw a punch at right, and he ducked it, and I accidentally hit Thez. And Thez has kind of got him hooked by the back of his arms, and he's dragging him away from me, and I'm going to nail right. It's my opportunity here. Obviously, I'm going to take the shot. And he ducks it, and I, I nail Thez, and Thez goes down, boy. I mean, <laughs> I hit him a good shot right on the chin. So uh, so when he went down, right, and I just continued. Uh I get a small package on Wright, and Thez, he's still down. He's not there to count him out. I, I over Wright for probably five seconds, and there's nobody counting. So I just let him go. I get up, and I find Thez just getting to his feet from the punch I hit him with. So I kind of pick him up from behind just to help him. But I think old Lou at this point is like he's a little confused about whether he's a referee or a wrestler. 
because he just switches into a full Nelson. He full Nelsons me and turns me around and right standing right there. So he hits me with a big right hand, man. He turns out my lights. Uh, that covers me. This counts me out. The crowd explodes. Wright becomes the new Southern heavyweight champion. I mean, uh, Thez was putting the belt around White, White, Ron Wright's waist when I staggered to my feet. Uh, so now Wright leaves the ring with not only my Southern belt, but with my secretary. So, uh, so this match is being recorded, and, uh, and it's going to obviously leave no doubt that I should get a rematch. Uh, we've been recording matches now for two weeks in a row. This is the second time we recorded the main event because it gives me an opportunity to actually be seen wrestling on the show since I don't, I refuse to wrestle on TV. So I get the opportunity. I watch the match and I actually commentate over it the next day on TV, the next morning on Saturday morning. Uh, and uh, so that, as I said, this gave me an opportunity to be seen wrestling on TV for a change. And the next Friday night on February 28, 1975, the main event is going to be me versus Ron Wright for that Southern title. But this time, there is no special referee. Now he has the title, and I've got the return match to win it back if I can. So Ron Wright comes out at the end of it naturally, as he's always going to do. He's got to run his mouth, and he brings out my secretary with him. And I barely get to the end of the match to show exactly what happened, and he's already in there and starting to brag about having both my belt now and my secretary. And uh, Big Jim Hess, you know, he's a big Ron Wright fan anyway, so he shoves his way into the argument. And I, for the first time, tell him really live on TV to shut his mouth. You know, you got no part in this. Just keep quiet here. <laughs> so, you know, because I'm not too happy with him anyway. And I think fans really are picking up on the fact that I don't like him. And uh, so it, it probably helps the program in a way. So controversy is kind of brewing everywhere at this point in that particular television program. So by the time Wright and I finish talking about this match and the fact that there is no special referee, that then we, uh, we go on and talk more about the secretary. And I say, look, I want to win my secretary back. Let's make this match not only for the Southern Heavyweight Championship, but whoever wins this match gets my secretary forever. This stuff back and forth with the secretary has got to come to an end. So... Again, momentum's retained. Uh, next Friday night, we're going to continue with the fifth straight match in Chihuahua Park that's going to sell out because of this Southern title. This is for the title, for the belt, for the secretary. Uh, there's a whole lot involved in it. Uh, so I mentioned earlier in the show that something's going on between Danny Hodge and Dale Lewis concerning the $1,000 challenge match. It's against the fans from the audience. You know, and, and being an owner, young owner, uh, I better throw that in. I'm only 26 years old at this point. I overhear them talking. And, it, and there's a little controversial tone within the conversation about how Dale, Danny said, telling Dale that he doesn't like the way he handles these matches. And, you know, and I, I'm, I'm not going to interrupt them, and I don't want them really to know I hear it, but I can't help but listen to this because this can, could have a bad effect on me in the future here. So, so Hodge has seen about four of these nights in which Dale wrestles against uh, these, these challengers that come from out of the crowd. And, uh, you know, he's seen him beat at this point 12 guys, basically. But he's telling Dale, you know, I hear him say, you know, I'm not impressed, you know. Uh, and, and I'm kind of wondering, well, what, what the heck doesn't impress you? But, uh, the, you know, what it gets to, the point he basically gets to is uh, you're not hurting them, you know. I mean, uh, so and I was uncomfortable with the tone of the conversation, but I'm really uncomfortable now that Danny's said, telling Dale, you know, uh, you need to, you need to hurt these guys. You know, you need to leave them either bleeding or screaming or stretching them. Or, you know, Dale's not that type of shooter. He's not going to do that to these guys, but he's also not going to hurt them. And that's the part that I feel comfortable with because I don't want him in there trying to break noses and, uh, and trying to break arms and legs. 
you know, that just makes no sense. I, I like the way Dale's handling it. So, uh, Dale and I have a little conversation. I pull him off to the side afterward. And, uh, uh, I want, I told him, I want you to continue not to hurt guys. I don't want you to hurt guys. It's not the concept here. It's not what I want to do. I just want them to see that wrestlers can beat anybody in the crowd or anybody basically on earth that doesn't know anything about wrestling. So Dale agreed with me and, uh, and I hope this is going to be the end of it. But unfortunately, that was not to be the case. And uh, we'll get to that in, in future studcast. But there's, there's real trouble brewing here basically over this thing that we're doing with these with it, wrestling the challengers from the audience. Hey, Ron, before we move on, I did want to ask you about something. With the February 21st card in Knoxville, the ad that got into the newspaper, it lists Professor Dale Lewis versus Don Kemp. Instead of Don Kent, Don Kemp. And also, this is Phil Hickerson, T-H-I-L, instead of obviously Phil Hickerson. Whose handwriting was it <laughs> that you were sending into the newspaper that caused them to have these misspellings? And what was your relationship like at this point with the newspaper? You were giving them material each and every week. You were buying ads each and every week. Were you happy with these ads? Were you not happy? Talk a little bit about that. Well, I was not happy with, uh, you know, any time that they misspelled things, uh, you know, I was like, wow, that, you know, that I, there's no excuse for that. But, but it could be that my handwriting wasn't that clear. So I'm going to take <laughs> some of the responsibility for it, obviously. But I felt like, you know, the, te the newspaper advertising was extremely important. It was going to reach the fans that I wasn't getting. Uh, you know, the, the fans were coming to chill Howie park with old blood and gut fans. And they probably didn't buy newspapers. Uh, they didn't care about that type of stuff, but I wanted to get those fans out there. The, the thousands and thousands of them that, uh, that did read newspapers. So, you know, I, I put these, uh, cards and these ads together and I'd send them out. And, uh, you know, when it, when it would come out, I'm, I'm buying a paper. I'm certainly going to look at the ad and I would see that type of thing, and it would really bother me. Uh, a couple of times I had conversations, obviously, with the people at the, that I was dealing with the newspaper. They're probably not the people at the top. There's somebody that, uh, that just uh, writes up these ads and uh, told them, you know, I want to try to get that name spelled properly if we can, for sure. And uh, so, yeah, that's a good question, though. I mean, uh, it's kind of crazy, you know. Till Hickerson is certainly not Phil Hickerson, you know. And uh, and uh, and there's a big difference between Kemp, Don Kemp, and Don Kent. And Don Kent's a pretty decent worker. I mean, you know, he's a he's got a little background though, so he means something on that card. And when they misspell a name, it's not doing me any favors. So uh, since you brought that up, uh, this card on the twenty first. Uh, has five wrestlers from West Tennessee, including Jerry Jarrett, the booker. Uh, it's the first time it's been that he has been actually to Knoxville since I took over, and uh, he's impressed. He told me that himself uh, with the talent that I put together in such a short period of time. Our relationship is getting stronger, uh, and now Jarrett's beginning to use some of my talent in Memphis as well as send me talent. Some guys from Memphis. Here's an example of it. He's got uh, three guys on there. He's got four guys on there, actually, on this card. Kent comes from there, too. And the guys in the tag match that he's involved in are all from, from uh, the west side of Tennessee. So uh, I'd already worked 17 times for him since my arrival in Tennessee from Florida. Uh, 13 times in Memphis, four times in Louisville. And, uh, and I told him I didn't really want to work in Louisville. Now, he's already booked me in there four times. So I'm kind of uh, being lenient with him. Uh, I want to make him happy because he's, he seems to be helping me and in, by sending me some talent. Uh, so he's, he likes my talent, obviously. And he's, he, you know, he says, I want to book Dale Lewis some. And uh, how about I book Ron Don Wright in Memphis some? You know, he hadn't used them there in many, many years. So I don't have a problem with it. I think this is a great benefit to both of us uh, because he doesn't have to carry as many full-time workers in his territory, and the same goes for me. And he doesn't have to send me talent for my TV, and in return, I don't have to send him any talent for his TV. In fact, I don't even go to his TV, and I'm, I'm the number one star in his territory, and they just film my matches and show them back on television. So... 
My TV show, per agreement with him, is now airing in Johnson City and reaching markets in five states. So I'm not running any live shows in Johnson City yet because I learned a valuable lesson when I jumped right into Kingsport expecting that I was going to draw right away. Uh, I learned that it takes time uh, to get your talent over enough to draw money with the new television program. And this is going to be a valuable lesson for me because when I buy Gulf Coast Wrestling, I'm going to sit and wait on those TVs to get over. I'm not going to make that mistake down there like I'm going to ma- like I make it here when I do my first wrestling company with Southeastern in Knoxville. And of course, we just talked a great deal about your entry in the Johnson City with Les Thatcher on Super Studcast number 16 because it's an interesting town in that no one knows exactly who owns it. The Crockett's think they own it. Jerry Jarrett and Christine Jarrett are obviously under the impression they own it and they're operating it. Ron Wright may think he owns it. (laughs) No one knows exactly who owns it, but you go in there and you really start doing well eventually. Well, eventually, yes, we do very well. Uh, You know, and it's really funny. uh, You know, Ron Wright thinks he owns this three cities. It's called the Tri-Cities. There's Johnson City, there's Kingsport, and there's Bristol, Tennessee. Uh, and they're all about 20 miles apart in a little triangular shape there. So uh, Ron Wright thinks he owns Kingsport, uh, and I don't know this. He didn't tell me about it, or maybe I would have made a different arrangement up there. Uh, obviously, Jarrett and Christine believe they own Johnson City, and uh, I don't know if you're aware of this, but Jim Crockett Sr. actually was born in Bristol. Yeah. So, you know, and he has a penchant uh, for Bristol. I mean, he he feels like, you know, B- Bristol should be something somewhat his in a way. So there's a lot of conflict over this Tri-City area up here. Uh, there's three television stations. Kingsport's got its own station. Johnson City's got a station. And Bristol has a station. So there's a lot of stuff happening up there. But you're right. We are going to go into Johnson City. And once we finally do start running it, we're going to have tremendous success in Johnson City. We're going to pump that Tri-City area up again for wrestling like it had been years earlier. So, uh, you know, when speaking of talent, uh, we talked about it a little second ago. Uh, let's just take a quick glimpse at the upgrade in talent from my first show in Knoxville on October 25th, 1974, to four months later in February 21st of 1975. So. Let's take a real quick look of who's on that card on October 25th, 1974, the first night I take over from John Kazana with the Southeastern Championship Wrestling. That card is Don Green, Jim White, Ron Fuller, obviously me, Solento Rodriguez, Mike Pedusis, Steve Kovacs, Terrence Garvin, Ron Garvin, Ron and Don Wright, 10 wrestlers. The card four months later, on on February 21st, 1975, is Lou Thez, me, Ron Wright, Dale Lewis, Les Thatcher, Dutch Mantell, John Foley, Rocky Smith, the former Inferno, Don Kent, Jerry Jarrett, Phil Hickerson, Jerry Bryant, and Doug Patton. Thirteen wrestlers, three more guys, but the quality there, you pick out names here that really, to me, are significant. And those are the wrestlers in this card. Uh, there's no real solid wrestler in that card of 10, 25, 74. But on this card, the four months later, you have Lou Thez, you have uh, Dale Lewis, and you have... Uh, you're going to have, who's on most every one of these, you're going to have uh, Danny Hodge as well. So, you know, we're I'm adding all these really, really tremendous wrestlers to the card as much as I can because I'm really trying to teach these fans about wrestling and how this is going to, how it should be done in the future and what to expect in the future. And one of the noticeable differences in the different crews from when you first got there to this point in February of 75 is that with the exception of some local guys like Ron and Don Wright, those shows were comprised of a crew with talent from the Nashville booking office. The guys you were using, with the exception of Jerry Jarrett and whoever came over from Memphis with him or was sent over by him, 
were all guys that were working your area. They were all exclusive, or not exclusive, but they weren't from another booking office. You were your right. own booking office now. Right. So I'm in a position where, you know, I've gotten out of that Nashville situation with the booking because it just wasn't good. It was not going to make me successful. Uh, in fact, I think it was going to make me fail if I had stayed into that relationship. Uh, I am adding a few guys from Memphis, but these are quality guys. These are all darn good workers. Uh, and some of these guys, I don't know if fans are really familiar with, but Phil Hickerson is a great worker, uh, a tremendous guy. Uh, Don Kent's a very good worker. Uh, and uh, Jerry Jarrett's a pretty decent worker, too. You know, I mean, uh, he's not bad himself. So, uh, you know, it's it's we have really kind of upgraded things in four months pretty spectacularly. And uh, I'm real happy with that. And as you say, now we're not dependent upon another company somewhere to provide us with wrestlers. I've gone out there and found my own guys. And most of this card on February 21st, 75 is my own wrestlers that are now wrestling for me as much or more so than anybody else. Ron, I know we're going to talk a little bit more about your family on the other side, but I did want to ask you one other thing. From when you first bought the territory or bought the town in October of 74 to this point, have you been thinking about how can I get my brother involved? How can I get my cousins involved? How can I get family involved? Because I know that's a crew that I can rely on. Had you already been thinking about this or where were you at? Did you like not having family around? Where were no, you at this point? I, no, I, I, I wanted them. I wanted them. Uh, I, I really believe Jimmy Goland is a, just a tremendous talent. Uh, uh, very underrated, uh, fabulous talent in the ring. And uh, my brother is very, very talented. And uh, Rob is going to come in. It's going to be a while before Rob arrives and stays. But when he does, he will come in and he will book. He will He will also do some booking. And he's he has a real good penchant for this. He has a real feel for as a booker. And uh, guys like him. That's important. Uh, he's going to be able to bring a lot of talent into the area that I might have had more difficulty with. Guys work with Rob. He's very smooth in the ring. He's uh, easy for them. He doesn't hurt them. I hurt him a little bit. So, you know, it's harder for me sometimes to deal with getting new talent if, they, if they're coming in and knowing that they're going to work with me a whole lot. And Rob probably, when he comes and starts getting talent, he's probably saying, I'm going to try to keep you away from Ron a lot. <laughs> so, so it might be a little bit of an incentive for some guys to come and work because they know they're going to be dealing a whole lot with Rob as a booker. And uh, now at this point, I'm just doing the booking myself in Knoxville. And what about Lester Sons? Lester's sons actually worked there in the early part here, and they are going to come back. They are going to return here. Uh, I'm going to start using them again that because they live pretty close. They're not wrestlers full-time anymore. Uh, Lester has gotten out of wrestling at this point and into the coal mining business. He's strip mining, uh, and they work for him with his company. They run the big dozers and the pans and all the things that you have to do to to, to make strip riding profitable and they're not wrestlers at this point, but I'm going to kind of sneak them back in Roy Lee, uh, in particular, but I will get Jackie back into, into wrestling some too, uh, within the next year. So I'm, I'm, I'm looking at family members, uh, because I can depend upon them. I feel comfortable with them. I don't, uh, I don't question their ability or their heart or their desire. They're, they're all in, and uh, that's kind of really what I want. Uh, I'm just now starting in my own territory, and I want everybody that's working for me to be all in. Ron, Jimmy Golden, your cousin, finally coming into Southeastern. Yes, and uh, man, I couldn't be more pleased about it. And Jimmy and I have spent some time in this four-month period of time here that I've had in, had my own wrestling company talking about him coming, uh, and not just coming and working uh, in some other territory like the western side of the state and uh, being there for for every once in a while, but actually moving and and coming to help me try to build the territory. 
uh, and, and uh, I mentioned it maybe briefly already, uh, you know, I think Jimmy was one of the most underrated wrestlers of all time. Uh, just he, and he has that, that innate ability to be, uh, to be equally as, as well as good in the ring as a heel or a baby face. Uh, and there's not a lot of guys that can do that, but Jimmy really has that ability to do it. And Jimmy's a young guy like I am at this point, but he's been actually wrestling longer than I have been in the ring. Uh, he is more experienced than I am. And, and I really just love the fact that he's going to come and uh, be there. He's going to start on February 28th. Uh, he's going to start the following week after the week we're talking about here. And he's going to quickly establish himself as a future star for the company because fans just love him. Uh, they realize and they recognize that talent, too. And they just they're going to really love Jimmy Golden in Southeastern wrestling. Uh, and speaking of Jimmy, uh, you know, on February 28, 1975 card, let's just take a look at that card, uh, because it's the last day of February in 1975. Uh, and on that card, DeVoy Brunson is going to wrestle Tony Costello. Now this first match is different than the one I've described from the week before. It doesn't have the two veterans in it. It doesn't have the great talent in it that, that, uh, matched the week before with John Foley and uh, Rocky Smith. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's not ideal for me uh, because uh, neither of these two guys are over in the territory. But as time goes by, uh, I'm going to be able to build such a fabulous talent level that my first matches are going to be with main event guys. And it takes a long time uh, to set your territory up that way. You know, when all of your wrestlers in your crew are stars, then it doesn't make any difference where you put them on the card because they're going to help you anywhere you put them. And that first match is so critically important because it sets the tone for the entire evening that uh, it's just, I'm going to, it's going to take a while for me to be able to bring in enough great wrestlers that this is going to happen. But eventually, Southeastern Wrestling will become one of those few territories in which everybody is a star. And you can you can see one guy on the main event one night and be first match the next night, and the guys on the card don't care. Uh, they just want to be a part of it, and they know they're going to get paid uh, pretty much the same because if you're all stars, you all deserve star payoffs, and uh, that's what you have to do when you do create that situation. Uh, the next match on that card of February 28th is Dale Lewis versus George Strickland. Now, Dale's going to continue his $1,000 challenge and wrestle as many fans from the audience as he wants, depending on his professional opponent, whoever he's wrestling that's a professional wrestler that night, and the length of that match. But uh, traditionally, uh, he's, he's, he's working with these guys like George Strickland here, who's not a big name. Uh, that match will probably only last about 10 minutes. And uh, that night, he's going to probably wrestle three guys from the audience. Uh, so uh, that's just uh, it's more important to me at this point, Dale's matches, uh, not with the pros that he wrestles against, but with the people from the audience that he wrestles against and how he makes how he stands out uh, and his ability as an amateur uh, shows up so well against these guys and from the crowd. And uh, these matches sometimes are, to me, better than the match that he's going to have with George Strickland. Uh, and I hate to say that, but to me, they are more important maybe than in match with George Strickland. Uh, the next match is going to be on the 28th is Les Thatcher against Danny Hodge. Uh, that's going to, should be a great match. Obviously it contains, uh, it'll contain a tremendous amount of wrestling. And, uh, these last two matches, the ones with Dale Lewis and George Strickland and Les Thatcher and Danny Hodge, uh, are, are just going to be perfect for what I'm trying to achieve. Uh, I'm going to have a lot of wrestling in these two particular matches here and that wrestling I'm going to, I'm going to force feed it basically to this blood and guts crowd that doesn't really go for it. I'm going to just keep force feeding it to them until they start to see it. And once they do, they're going to become wrestling fans too, as well as just, you know, blood and guts fans. 
And uh, that's my that's my goal because I really want to build my company around the word wrestling. Yeah. Then the next match after that Danny Hodge and uh, Dale Lewis uh, matches will be Jimmy Golden and Rocky Smith. It'll be Jimmy's first night there, and he's teaming up with an old veteran man, uh, the the club footed uh, Inferno that won ninety five percent of their matches. And they're going to wrestle against Dutch Mantell and John Foley, who are pretty well over at this point. Now, they've been there as tag partners, and they've held the Tennessee Tag Team Championships, uh, and they're, they're strong there. So, new star Jimmy's going to make his debut. And, uh, and uh, he's, his partner is just fabulous, man. Uh, the Rocky is just amazing in there. And uh, so, this match going to Brock. That, that match is going to be a great match as well. And then in the last one, Obviously, uh, that's going to be me and Ron Wright uh, for the Southern Championship, and the winner's going to get the belt and the secretary forever. So there's a lot of stake in this match, and after losing my belt the week before, uh, it's my first loss as a Southern Champion in more than two months of defending it. My secretary's become an integral part of the matches, and Ron Wright and that angle is now in its fourth week. This is four weeks now that he's had my secretary and uh, and he's really pushed it and really gotten that over. And uh, it's definitely helped to fill Knoxville's Chilhai Park, that smaller building in in the Knoxville Chilhai Park, the Jacobs building. Uh, We're now stacking up some sellouts uh, back to back and and, uh, headed in the right direction. Hey, Ron, two quick questions. One, the newspaper ad for the show lists the tag team match for the Tennessee tag titles. Dutch Mantell and John Foley defending against Jimmy Golden and Jerry Bryant. Of course, on the previous week's show, on the 21st, it had been Jerry Bryant teamed with Jerry Jarrett. Jerry Bryant is a guy people typically think of as being part of the Western Tennessee wrestling promotion. Is there anything to read into him not being there and him being replaced in that match with Rocky Smith other than he didn't make the trip? Well, you know, things happen all the time uh, in wrestling. Uh, guys get hurt, uh, and it's 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 not a real uh, <laughs> simple game, basically. You know, uh, and uh, you never know uh, something happens, and a family member, uh, the, somebody dies, and you know, you you got to be accustomed to substitution. Uh, as long as your substitute is a good wrestler and a great worker, uh, that. That makes that makes it all right. And in this case, uh, since uh, it's supposed to have been Bryant and it's actually going to end up being Rocky Smith, that's an upgrade to me. That's a that's an even better match uh, because of what happened and Bryant not showing up and having a guy like Rocky Smith, who is one of those old professionals that like to come and be there. He'd bring his bag with him if he wasn't on the card and you needed somebody he wouldn't have a problem at all with stepping in and taking that spot. And that was always a great benefit. Uh, when you have a night in which you've got a substitute and you've got a guy that's maybe better than the guy he's substituting for, uh, that's a golden, golden little deal right there. The newspaper ad lists Rocky Smith originally as being booked against Tony Costello, who, as you said previously, had wrestled earlier in this card against Devoy Brunson whose name has come up several times. You never really say anything that good about him. Not that you say anything bad about him, but he usually comes up right before you talk about how you're upgrading the talent. What can you yeah. tell me about Devoy Brunson? Devoy Brunson is a great guy. He's, he's, a, he's a young guy, and uh, he's, 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 going, he's got some future in the sport. Uh, there's quite a few of them in that East Tennessee area, and I'm learning as I've, I've taken over here as, a, as an owner – uh, who can and who can't. And, uh, and I put these guys on TV. Uh, they normally do jobs for somebody, but I really get a good idea of where they should be on a card. And Devoy uh, is a first match guy. I, I don't know that he'll ever get off that first match. Uh, and I think Devoy Brunson is going to be when the war starts in 1979 with the Knoxville Five. He's going to be a first match guy for them. Uh, and that's five years down the road. So he's not going to improve dramatically, but uh, he has some talent. And as I said, you've got to fill out these cards. You don't have a booking office that you can call and say, I need this many guys for my card. Uh, I'm having trouble and struggling to find the right guys. 
but I'm upgrading continuously, and hopefully the fans can see it. Beyond Knoxville, beyond Southeastern, what other shows are you working? Obviously, you're still making shots in various other places outside of your own territory. Yep, I certainly am. You know, I've wrestled uh, in this two-week period of time here, basically, toward the end of February. I'm going to wrestle twice in Memphis. Both are championship matches, once against Steve Kovac, good worker, and another against Phil Hickerson, another good worker. Uh, I'm also going to work in Louisville twice during that two-week period of time. I'm going to defend the title against Tojo Yamamoto and Steve Kovac. So the first two months of 1975, I, like I said earlier, I defended my title 13 times, and I've only lost one time, and that was to Ron Wright. You know, and a Tojo. Now, this we'll talk to very briefly about Tojo Yamamoto here. I'm wrestling him in Louisville. Tojo's probably he can't be five two. You know, he's he's very very short, uh, kind of like a roly poly, a little a little bowling ball type, and uh, <laughs> bald head, uh, not handsome. I'm a heel. I'm a heel, and he looks like the heel. I look like the baby face, but I'm the heel in those matches with Tojo. And Tojo, I always remember Tojo. When I was a kid, I watched Tojo a lot. He wrestled for my dad. He wrestled in Memphis for many, many years, was over tremendously in Memphis. And uh, Tojo was a fantastic little heel. He would, he would, when he did things to the guys and he got them down, he would, he would bend over and he would, he would like a little creep and he would just slowly sneak around behind them. And the fans would like, go, Oh no, no, no. They'd be screaming. No, no, no. So, you know, to work with Tojo as, as him and the baby face as a baby face and me and a heel was a real experience for me. Uh, you know, it's pretty hard when you're that much bigger than somebody to be able to go out there as a heel and get heat. But uh, I had some fairly decent matches with Tojo. Ron, I know this is a little bit in advance of what we're talking about now because we're still in February. But in March, you run the Coliseum again. Are you already planning that out and thinking about that right here at this point at the end of February? Uh, yes. Yes, I am. You know, and, uh, and you know, uh, uh, I guess, you know, in this case, uh, I'm going to take off my wrestler hat and I'm going to put on the promoter and the booker hat here because, uh, you know, I find out from Chihuahua Park that that there's a Friday night in March that it's not going to be available. That's most unusual because Friday night is the wrestling night there in that building. And uh, one they've given it out to somebody else for whatever reason. So. So I'm going to I'm going to then start looking for thinking about the Coliseum again. I don't want to lose a week because I, that's a killer to momentum. And we've got some momentum going here. And so I'm going to uh, to check with the Coliseum and see if I that Friday night and which is not available in Chihuahua Park is available in the Coliseum. Well, I'm not lucky enough for that to be the case. That Friday night is not available. But I do find out that two days later on March 23rd, and this Friday, March 21st, is the one that uh, that we're having to move, I can get the Coliseum on Sunday the 23rd of 1975. And uh, I put a lot of thought into this, uh, whether to try this or not. I mean, a Sunday, I mean, you, you we're still in the winter. It's winter time in Knoxville still. And when you run on Friday nights, the weather, especially if it snows in the south, whenever it snows in the south, it's going to kill your business. It's going to hurt you badly. Uh, but, you know, by going in there, obviously, I don't want to run a Sunday night. That's a terrible night to run on. Uh, but I've started thinking about what about running on a Sunday afternoon at 3 o'clock in the afternoon? Uh, then I start, to, you know, really thinking about the, what's involved here i mean if it snows people are going to be more inclined to come out mid-afternoon rather than drive in at night with ice on the road and snow on the road uh the day's going to be a little bit warmer than the nighttime so if you run in the afternoon it's going to be a little warmer than it will be if you run at night and the fans really don't have much going on that time of year uh in the winter time on sunday afternoons so 
So I was already thinking about the potential weekly shows in the Coliseum in the future. I'm thinking, you know, I, I'm just focused on the Coliseum. I want to be there every week instead of in Chihuahua Park. So I'm thinking now in the future, if I get to where I run there every week, what is the possibility of running at 3 o'clock on Sunday afternoons in the wintertime rather than running on Friday night? Uh, so so I'm, uh, I don't want to give up uh, running regularly, and especially since I have some momentum, especially with these recent crowds. I've stacked five sellouts in a row in, in uh, Chilhowee Park. I certainly don't want to be off. So my, I finally make the decision that I'm going to try Sunday afternoon at 3 o'clock on March 23rd, 1975. And I base my thinking on just finding out for myself now uh, whether there's a possibility that that's going to be a workable deal or whether it's not come time that I can possibly move to the Coliseum. And I certainly want to be in that Coliseum full time. So I'm going to build this card uh, for this Sunday afternoon event over the next couple of stud casts. Uh, so since I have six weeks to prepare for this card, I'm going to tell fans this week uh, just one of the matches that I'm going to put on that card for March 23rd. Uh, so due to my time in St. Louis working, working with the greats of the sport, you know, I mean, I worked with all of the big names, man, for, and during 73 and 74 in St. Louis. And, uh, and I've made some great connections with many of those stars. Uh, so this Coliseum's the perfect time. This Coliseum show, this second one is a perfect time for me to call in some favors and add some big time names to that card. And one of my good friends from my St. Louis days was Bobo Brazil. Uh, he's nationally recognized, and he had never been to Knoxville. He's in every wrestling magazine during this time frame from 70 to 75. You can't hardly buy a wrestling magazine that doesn't have Bobo on the cover or he's certainly going to be inside. So this is bringing a big-time star to Knoxville with Bobo. Uh, he's nationally recognized, never been there before. So I contact him and he's happy as heck to hear from me. And he, he's happy to work the show for me. He says, yeah, Ron, I'd love to work it. So, so the first match I booked for that March, 1975 Coliseum show is going to be Bobo Brazil versus crazy Luke Graham. Uh, I know that these two are going to give me a blood and guts type match for Knoxville fans, for those that love that type of stuff as part of my second Coliseum show. I got to give them some of that in that show. And uh, so I figure I'm going to do Bobo and crazy Luke Graham. Uh, now we're going to talk more about this show in March uh, next stud cast and following them probably at one after that as well. will probably be to this show, but uh, you know, well, uh, it's uh, it's really important. The, these Coliseum shows are really, really important for me because I'm building for the future. And these fans that are going to come to Coliseum aren't going to come to Chill Howie Park. So I need these guys like Bobo. I need these big names on these cards to drag those people down to the Coliseum that would normally not come because it's they, they, they want to see those stars. They have that opportunity. So I'm really encouraged about the potential for this show due to my current string of sellouts, as I said before, at the, at Joe Howie Park. And it's always very exciting to plan and to implement big shows. It's, it's fun to put together a big show. It's fun to think about how, who, to, who to put together, uh, who would have the best matches. Uh, so it's, it's, I'm having a good time at this point. Uh, I'm a young guy. Uh, I'm starting to see a little life out of Knoxville. And uh, now I get an opportunity every once in a while to throw something into that Coliseum and see where we can go with it. Ron, you spoke earlier about the talent upgrade you made and that there was one specific wrestler that was part of the upgrade that you wanted to do a focus on here today. Yeah, I kind of I kind of want to do something special here about the guy that came to work for me and made a commitment to me, moved into Knoxville, uh, and that's Dale Lewis. And, uh, you, know, uh, it, you know, it's just impossible almost to find a guy of that caliber to come and live in your town and do you a favor. Uh, and I, I just really loved him. So, um, you know, 
Yeah, I want to kind of highlight Dale Lewis a little bit. We don't really take time to we're, – we're mentioning a lot of wrestlers, but I want to take Dale Lewis and really take fans on a little trip here with me that I find to be just amazing about this particular guy. So, you know, Dale Lewis's real name is Dale Folsom Lewis. Uh, he was born in uh, – uh, 1935, and he died in uh, 1997 at 62 years of age. Uh, he was a fabulous amateur wrestler, and he was a guy that had just truly natural wrestling ability, uh, and so much so that he made his first Olympic team just six months after the first time he ever wrestled. That, to me, is just wow. It, it's unbelievable. I could not, I, I looked this up and I talked to Dale about it. And he said, Ron, you know, I went into the Marines and, and, uh, and that's where I really started wrestling and I'd never wrestled before. And he said, I got to be darn good, pretty darn good quick, you know? And, uh, I guess through his exposure with the Marines and being a Marine and being a, a great wrestler with the Marines, he was able to get on an Olympic team to, to have somebody take a look at him for the Olympic team. So, uh, he is one of the fewest, few wrestlers, maybe the only one in history. I can't find out this for sure, but he, to me, He's one of the few wrestlers for sure to ever represent the United States in the Olympics before winning a national championship. Most of the time, these wrestlers that get into the Olympic on those Olympic teams have won national championships and made their names before. Dale Lewis gets on an Olympic team after only wrestling six months in his entire life. That, to me, is just absolutely awesome. And then when he goes, finishes his tour as a Marine, he then decides he wants to go to the University of Oklahoma, and he goes there and wins two national championships. He's going to the Olympic team in 1956 in Melbourne, Australia, and goes back in 1960 in Rome, Italy. And he's actually going to win the Pan American Games in 1959. But that fact to me, uh, Brian, is just really remarkable that you can accomplish that with only six months of training. It seems almost impossible because it's not just learning it and getting to the Olympics. How do you get discovered? You know, it's, if you're not part of the system already, if you're not a high school wrestler or a wrestler in college, how do you all of a sudden just pick it up in the Marines? and then get discovered and make it onto the Olympic team. It's, it's unfathomable. Yeah. To me, that's, a, that's a, just a remarkable feat to have accomplished. And I think he was a high school athlete. He played football and there was another sport that he had played as well, but uh, no one knew he could wrestle and he didn't know he could wrestle till someday uh, in the Marines, he gets on a mat with somebody and all of a sudden he's a natural. And uh, so so let's talk a little bit about his pro career. I mean, obviously he's known, his, his pro name was the Professor Dale Lewis, and, uh, and he actually won 19 championships. Uh, you know, and, and guys win a lot of championships that somehow don't get into their record books. And uh, maybe he won more than this number, but I'm, I'm pretty sure that he won at least 19 championships. He wrestled everywhere from Vancouver, Canada to Australia and Japan and all across America. And some of those uh, titles included uh, the AWA Tag Team Championship three times, AWA Tag Team Champion, uh, the NWA National Championship. He won that. Uh, he also won the NWA Florida Championship, and he was one half of the NWA Austro-Asian Tag Champions nine different times. I did not know uh, when Dale and I talk about it uh, that he had been in Australia as many times as he was there. I was there twice. I think he was there four times. Uh, he just uh, really made a name for himself in Australia. Uh, and then he was inducted into the George Tragus and Luthez Pro Wrestlers Hall of Fame in 2007. Uh, so, you know, we had an illustrious career. But I'm going to be honest with you. When I look at Dale and I see this record that he has as an amateur and what he accomplished as an amateur winning the national championship in Oklahoma in 1961 and 62, 
that, uh, you know, I think he was a better amateur wrestler maybe than he was as a pro. And, uh, you know, I'm not being, that's not, I'm not trying to make any detrimental compliment uh, or any remarks about him. Uh, Dale's a great wrestler, period, you know, but, uh, the, his success in the amateur ranks is maybe even more successful than he was as a professional. Uh, we become close friends uh, during this time frame in 1974, late 74, early 75. And I really find out what a great athlete he really was because I competed with him almost daily. We got together. He liked to play tennis and he liked to play racquetball. And uh, he weighed about 270, 280, sometimes 290. Uh, but for a big guy, he was real, real agile and quick. Uh, and uh, he wrestled every week for me from the last Friday in 1974 until April 11th in 1975. And just a tremendous guy to be around. Uh, really, really enjoyed being, being around him. And as I close here, uh, uh, I want to, uh, Dale, Dale, I'm going to estimate that Dale Lewis shot with at least 36 competitors from the audience uh, during his time in Southeastern Wrestling and with me. And uh, what he accomplished in these shoots was absolutely invaluable to me, improving to my Southeastern crowds. Uh, what real wrestlers can do against any competition. I don't care what sport they're in. Uh, if they can really wrestle, they're never going to get beat. Uh, he was a very quiet and humble guy. Uh, and he made a really made a lasting impression on me and many other people from around the world. When I've talked to people about Dale Lewis and, uh, you know, uh, God rest his soul. He was a tremendous talent. Uh, in wrestling, amateur and professional. And uh, I hope this is some type of tribute to Dale Lewis t today. Well, Ron, as we wrap things up, we want to remind the listeners that they can become friends with you on Facebook, the page, Ron Fuller, the Tennessee stud. You could also follow the Tennessee stud on Instagram and Twitter at Ron Fuller Welch. You can follow me on Twitter at great Brian last, and you can hear me on the 605 super podcast at 605pod.com or available wherever it is that you find your favorite podcasts for classic wrestling talk and wrestling humor. Download the 605 Super Podcast. We also want to remind you about Super Studcast number 16. It's another great one. This, of course, with Les Thatcher. Hear Les and Ron sit back and tell fantastic stories about their 49-year friendship and, of course, about the historic creation of Southeastern Wrestling and a studio wrestling show that fans talk about to this very day. Hear that show right now. Part one is up at tnstud.com or patreon.com slash studcast. You can get in the door for only $2.99. It's the best deal in wrestling. tnstud.com or patreon.com slash studcast. Ron, where are we going next week? Well, we're going to get the results of this February 28, 1975 card from Knoxville that I just uh, just talked about. Uh, and uh, we're going to add more matches to the March 23rd, 1975 Coliseum that I'm starting to put together. Uh, we're going to talk about a rare boxing match that's about to happen uh, within Southeastern Wrestling. And we're going to cover other places that I'm wrestling. And uh, and uh, I'd like to thank all our fans uh, from around the world for riding with me every every program, every studcast. And uh, if you enjoy the studcast, please tell your friends about us. And uh, don't forget to saddle up with me again next week. Ron Fuller's studcast is a production of the Arcadian Vanguard Podcast Network. For the Tennessee stud Ron Fuller, I'm the great Brian Last. The story continues next week.